And now to today's event uh, on a key issue for Hong Kong, its freedoms, and in particular, its uh, academic freedoms, and obviously, press freedoms. In recent months, we've seen increased pressure from the Chinese authorities and Beijing supporters in Hong Kong on anyone with a different view on Beijing's policies and its version of history in academia, in the media, and in politics in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and around the world. Among those with a different view, Benny Tai, recently dubbed a national security threat by the Chinese authorities after he suggested that independence for Hong Kong could be an option for the autonomous region of China in the event of a collapse of the Communist Party. The People's Daily wrote then that it was time to use a sledgehammer to crush pro-independence advocates, whilst one Hong Kong lawmaker suggested that Professor Tai be sacked for his irresponsible remarks that could lead to violence and great bloodshed. I'm giving all these details because unfortunately we could not find a speaker uh, for today from the pro-establishment side who would be willing to come and explain uh, the Beijing's point of view. We were hoping for a real debate, but we are down to a debate between <laughs> uh, according uh, views. We ask, uh, among others, to Regina Hip herself, or if she could recommend someone else. We also asked Olden Chow whether they would attend, but uh, we were not successful. So we'll try and have a debate nevertheless among these uh, agreeing views. Benny Tai, very briefly, as you know, is an associate professor of law at uh, Hong Kong University. He's published vi various works on constitutional matters affecting Hong Kong and China, and he's obviously uh, famous for launching the idea of Occupy Central and his role in the Umbrella Movement. Kenneth Chan is a former LegCo member for the Civic Party, who is an associate professor of political science at Baptist University of Hong Kong, and is a frequent commentator on Hong Kong Chinese and international politics. Please join me in welcoming these two very distinguished guests to the podium. So Benita will start our, his remarks, and then Kenneth, and then we'll have an exchange. Thank you. Um, President Florence, thank you for inviting me to speak again at FCC. Last time, I was asked to talk about whether Hong Kong ever have a chance to have genuine democracy. Now that was, the, the time was 26 September 2014. That was before the outbreak of the Occupy Central and the Umbrella Movement. Since then, I think all of you, like me, can observe that there have been a lot of changes in Hong Kong. After the Umbrella Movement, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, has adjusted her strategy towards Hong Kong. Now the systems in Hong Kong in the past was neither democratic nor authoritarian. So you may say that it's a semi-democracy or a semi-authoritarian system. But Many people in Hong Kong may prefer to recognize the Hong Kong system as semi-democratic, at least because we have elements of the rule of law in Hong Kong, which can constrain the powers of the government, as well as protecting the fundamental rights of citizens. Now, three to four years after the last occasion, I think I can now answer the question I may not be able to provide a clear answer last time. Definitely that we are not going to have genuine democracy in Hong Kong. Now since the umbrella movement, I think not only that there will be no chance for genuine democracy, 
the strategy of the CCP is now to authoritarianize Hong Kong, a very difficult word to pronounce, authoritarianize Hong Kong. Now, ironically, the method that has been used by the CCP to authoritize Hong Kong is also the rule of law. But this rule of law is very different from the rule of law that many people in Hong Kong embrace. Now, according to the very thin understanding of the rule of law advocated by the CCP, the most important thing is that everything must be done in accordance with law. The law can be vaguely draft, allowing the government officials to enjoy very wide powers, and the legal procedures may not need to satisfy some basic requirements of procedural fairness. The power holders now have the power to make the law, to interpret the law, and to implement the law. So even if we have an independent judiciary, the most important function of law now is to maintain social order, even at the cost of granting arbitrary powers to the government, and even at the cost of the fundamental rights of Hong Kong citizens. Now, some scholars call this kind of rule of law the authoritarian rule of law. So the paradox we are now facing in Hong Kong is that the greatest threat to our rule of law is also the rule of law. Two kinds of rule of law we are talking about. Now the authoritarian rule of law is now being implemented in many different ways. Surely the most important power, as some of you may know, is the power to interpret the basic law by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. Now in the past, the Standing Committee was more reluctant to use this power as the CCP might worry that any use of the power may hurt the judicial authority of Hong Kong. But now we find that the, overcome, uh, the CCP has overcome this reluctance and the use will be more normalized. Surely the latest example is the interpretation of Article 104 of the Basic Law on Oath Checking. I don't think I need to elaborate too much about the oath checking uh, interpretation. The interpretation by the Senate Committee has now been used as the constitutional basis to disqualify six legislators elected by Hong Kong people. And our courts, even our Court of Final Appeal, cannot question the authority of such interpretation by the Standing Committee of the NPC. Now, another measure of authoritarian rule of law is to extend the powers of officials under existing laws, even if this may deviate from their past practices and the meaning of the legal provisions might have to be uh, twisted. And the example is the power of the returning officer to invalidate nominations of candidates on the ground that the candidate was holding an opinion that is not upholding the basic law. On this basis, I think in the past uh, two years, many candidates, their nomination were invalidated, and so they were disqualified to stay in, in the elections. However, there's no definition of what is the meaning of upholding the basic law not in the basic law itself, and not even in the interpretation by the Standing Committee on Article 104. And that is the political red line now. Now the political red line at the beginning was the stance supporting the independence of Hong Kong. So candidates who support independence of Hong Kong were disqualified. Then the political red line moved 
to the stance of supporting Hong Kong's people's right of self-determination to decide Hong Kong's political future. Again, candidate was disqualified. The line is still moving. It's continuing to move. So I think you expect me to talk something about my speech in Taiwan. So actually, what I have said in Taiwan, I just, uh, actually, that was a very short comment at the end of the, of the seminar. Um, I make some kind of concluding remarks in responding to views of other participants in the seminar. I said that um, in case the authoritarian rule in China were to end and a democratic order were to be established in China, Hong Kong people may have to consider our relationship with other people's groups in China. There can be three options. I mentioned independence, federation, and confederation like the European Union. Actually, I did not express my personal view on which option I prefer. So surely now we know that this kind of views would also be disallowed. Now, it's likely that any opinion that deny, question, challenge, or suggest an alternative view to Hong Kong status as an inalienable, inalienable part of China will be considered as not upholding the basic law. So the, this term, not upholding the basic law, will be the magic words now. What will be included in this magic term? No one knows until the time the returning officer exercises her power to disqualify candidates. Now, this moving red political red line may not only affect Hong Kong people's right to stand in the election. I think it's generating very serious chilling effect in all sectors of the community, be it in the university and be it in the media. People may avoid to talk about things that might have a chance to fall under this magic term, upholding the basic law, which no one can know what exactly it means uh, uh, that uh, whether your speech or whether your, the things you're going to write is something not upholding the basic law. So people will have to prepare that they will suffer in case this political red line moves upon them. But I can still see hope, though surely people will criticize me as too optimistic or even too naive that uh, I can I still say there might be hope. Now my hope is on the civil society of Hong Kong, including we are, what we are doing here at the FCC. Now, if there are still sufficient number of people who are not going to give up our thicker understandings or the original understandings of the rule of law, and if we are willing to speak up and also vote smartly in future elections. Again, this part I'm not going to elaborate too much, but as you know that a lot of things I'm doing after the umbrella movement are all related with uh, the elections, the district council elections, the coming uh, legislative council elections. And um, now surely, unlike what happened in Malaysia, we will not be able to change our form of the government, but at least I hope that we can slow down the process of authoritarianization, again, very long and difficult to pronounce, authoritarianization in Hong Kong. Now to me, it is the duty of everyone in Hong Kong to defend our rule of law against the encroachment of the authoritarian rule of law, the conflict of the two rule of law. 
Now, maybe some of you may ask my comments on Eberlung's uh, 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 sentence. Um, so I'll give a brief comment on that. To me, I find that the judge might have expressed it. I'm not, you may say it's criticizing or not, but I'm just stating what I've observed, that you can find a very strong pro-order sentiment in the uh, judgment of this judge. And uh, therefore, it's not just the duty of lawyers, judges, legal professionals to defend our rule of law. Actually, it's everyone. Every one of us have the duty to defend the rule of law of Hong Kong. And I hope, just hope that you join with me. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President, for your kind invitation and thanks for the very nice introduction. Uh, very pleased to be here. I used to come here quite often when I was uh, busy somewhere else uh, near Lachco uh, during my very short but uh, very exciting intensive four-year term of office. Uh, glad to be here, see many old friends and new friends uh, meeting me today. Really appreciate that. I will focus my um, talk on academic freedom and civil liberties. Uh, clearly, people sitting here today attending this lunch will understand that civil liberties and academic freedom in Hong Kong are indeed under threat. First of all, politically, I think Benny here has already spoken uh, quite extensively about the kind of political uh, threats we have to face altogether. Censorship, self-censorship, different kinds of red lines, yellow lines, blue lines, and no-go areas that would expand forever and ever, depending on the mood, the feelings of the power that be. As an academic trying to fight for democracy, human rights, and social progress, it has become a more and more difficult time. Um, but that's not the end of it. We also face financial threats too. Universities in Hong Kong, of course, are mostly funded by public money, but the money is getting smaller and smaller in relationship to the needs that we, the tertiary institutions, will require to expand and do good work for Hong Kong and the rest of the world. UGC funded staff members of all the eight public funded, publicly funded universities have come down from about 80, 90% back in the mid 1990s to just about 53% today. So universities have to raise money from the private sector, from alumni. And these people usually have very good connections with Beijing or have their investments in Beijing, the rest of China, and so on, who tell the universities, hey, you have troublemakers, right? At Hong Kong U, at Baptist U, or some of the students are too active, high profile in the Occupy Central Movement and perhaps the Mong Kok riots. And it did happen to my university specifically, one of those potential donors threatened the university that they would turn the tap off. They would totally withdraw the money for some of the scholarships because our students at Baptist University were not behaving during the umbrella movement. It did happen. And of course, what else? The leaders count out. This is the financial threat that we have to face day in, day out at university. I've been told at work that, hey, Kenneth, can you just adjust your profile a little bit? It's a little bit embarrassing. I have to go to out fundraising and people keep asking me about your views about the future of China and your relationship. I don't have any relationship with CY Leung. He thought he had a relationship with me, but that's his problem. <laughs> we also face um, managerial threats or mismanagerial threats. You understand that when universities have to rely increasingly on um, self-financed programs, self-financed staff, and so on. They really have to be flexible. That means a tenureship or substantiation would become harder and harder and harder to get for junior academics 
working in Hong Kong. Now, tenure is a very important institutional element for academic freedom because we speak out, both Benny and I are tenured staff members of the universities and therefore we, we dare. But with all the threats combined politically, financially, managerially, many of my young colleagues, they won't for fear of losing their jobs. But above all, ladies and gentlemen, I think the biggest threat of all to Hong Kong's civil liberties and academic freedom would be ignorance. Ignorance. Many university people think that, oh, Kenneth, don't just you know, complain about Hong Kong. It's OK. Shut your door, focus on your monitor, and work, and work, and work. It's freedom there, freedom within your office, your cabinet. But no, sorry about that. Academic freedom implies very active social involvement. We are expected to be able to speak truth to power. Most academic leaders, most scholars, they think that, no, 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 it's all about public, 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 uh, publishing your works. A in book, another article, you know, privately talk to people, privately interviewing people, and be good. This is wrong. Most of our colleagues probably have not heard about the Lima Declaration. This declaration is a founding, a foundation, a founding stone of academic freedom in contemporary times. And it's stated quite clearly, clause uh, 15 of the Lima Declaration, I quote very briefly, all institutions of higher education shall address themselves to the contemporary problems facing society. To this end, the curricula of these institutions as well as their activities shall respond to the needs of society at large. Institutions of higher education should be critical, critical of, the, of conditions of political repression and violation of human rights within their own society. End quote. Clause 15 of the Lima Declaration. I, I, I doubt, or I guess, if you just go with this and ask, I don't know, the presidents of the universities in Hong Kong whether or not they've heard about that, probably they say, what? What is it? Another very important piece of document is called the, um, obviously I overprepared. I will try to make it very brief. The UNESCO Statement on Academic Freedom 1997. It talks about the importance of tenure, substantiation for the protection of academic freedom, as I said already. But also, very importantly, sorry to say that again, Benny, uh, I guess you're probably uh, worrying about job security after you know, all, the, um, all the court cases are over and so on. And uh, clearly, there are signs that Arthur Lee, or AKA King Arthur, the chairman of the University Council at Hong Kong University, would do something against you. Right, once you're being sentenced uh, by the court in Hong Kong. But it states here, the UNESCO statement, if I may, dismissal should only be for just and sufficient cause related to professional misconduct. Full stop, that's it. No one among us academics should be removed from our position because of our social and political activism. And yet, ironically, the academic leaders or the social leaders in Hong Kong, they really had no clue what exactly academic freedom and civil liberties demand from them. And therefore, I said, well, above all, ignorance has become the biggest threat to academic freedom and civil liberties in Hong Kong. Looking forward, uh, I am afraid I have to sound a little pessimistic. Uh, honestly, because of the chilling effects coming down on each one of us. Uh, we've been used ex as examples a lot of times around Hong Kong by the social and political leaders and by our senior colleagues as well. So how do we behave or how should we behave? Uh, obviously, avoid the red lines, whatever lines, don't enter the no-go areas, sidestep, catwalking, whatever. Um, but increasingly, you have to look not unpatriotic. This is the way I phrase it. Do not look unpatriotic. How do you look patriotic? Well, there are many different ways you can look patriotic or seem patriotic. But at least if you don't want to join the bandwagon of patriotism, please at least behave in such a way not to be misunderstood as unpatriotic. This is already happening to Hong Kong when Xi Jinping announced that, wow, yes, uh, innovation and technology, right? I give you the money. 
money coming down to Hong Kong. That's his directive. And adding to that directive, Xinhua News Agency and other sources of information suggested that, yeah, money would come to Hong Kong, especially financing research done by patriotic scholars. What, do we have to sing the red songs as a qualifier to start with? The government of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, didn't say much about that. It's hugely embarrassing. Our government, our ministers, they really had no clue. So if you ask them, should I behave patriotically? Uh, how should I behave? And they say, well, at least try not to be seen as unpatriotic. Now, this leave a big and growing gray area. And it's very oppressive. Welcome to 1984, although this is 2018. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the two of you. Um, yeah, pretty concerning <laughs> presentation. Can I start by playing a little bit the devil's advocate, unless there is someone else in the, in the room who will play that role. But um, Benny, when you say that um, upholding the basic law is not defined anywhere. I think for possibly the Chinese authority or the Hong Kong government, they often refer, refer to the first article, the basic law, that very clearly says that Hong Kong is part of China. And I think that's what they have in mind first and foremost. So they ask everyone by upholding the basic law to just recognize that Hong Kong is fully part of China, and that's, that's something that people do confess. So that's the one thing, and then uh, following up on what you said as well, if you think there will be no genuine democracy in Hong Kong, why fight such a battle? Well, um, for anyone who now wants to stand in the election, you have to sign also a confirmation form. And on that form, you have to uh, actually state that you understand that upholding basic law means to uphold the provisions of basic law, including Article 1 that you mentioned, and Article 12 that Hong Kong enjoys a high degree of autonomy, and Article 159, Paragraph 4, that uh, the uh, amendment that's concerning about the only way to amend the basic law. But another article that has not been mentioned, that's Article 39 of the basic law. This is about the application of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And also Article 27 about the freedom of speech. And we've just talked before the lunch, uh, the idea of the rule of law uh, by the government now excludes uh, freedom of speech on stance concerning independence, self-determination. So the government stands now, these are not within the scope of freedom of expression, but actually I don't see how that cannot be freedom of expression. We are just mentioning something as a possibility, and even that can be uh, considered to be not upholding the basic law. Now, so that's why I say the rule of law now is a very different kind of rule of law from what we used to have. It's a authoritarian rule of law. So why still fight? if we cannot have genuine democracy. So I think it's now, now at, at games, sometimes you play the offensive, sometimes you play the defensive. And so that's now, at this moment, I think we are defending our rule of law, defending our freedoms in Hong Kong, to wait for a moment, the moment, that actually the moment that I talk about in Taiwan, though I never know when that will come, it may be tomorrow, or it may be 10 years from now, it may be even 20 years from now, it may be even beyond 2047, no one knows. But I think it's important that at least we can do something to slow down the process of this authoritization, to maintain our existing rule of law, not to allow the uh, sliding back to happen so fast. I think that's the reason why we're doing things uh, here in Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Uh, before uh, we open to the floor, would it be all right to ask uh, Martin Lee, who uh, is uh, visiting today, to, to comment on, uh, on, these, uh, on, on what he's heard so far? 
Thank you for joining us, by the way. I would like to be a little less pessimistic. Because how do you know that we will never have anything? How do you know that we will always have something? I mean, this world has changed so much that in the United States of America, they are no longer talking about the truth. They talk about alternative facts. And uh, Donald Trump and, um, and Kim having a, a summer meeting. Things are, I mean, half a year ago, could you think of that? And these would have been impossible things. So to me, nothing is impossible. And since, Benny, you're going to fight, continue to fight for democracy, of course I'll be on your side. Um, but uh, you may feel that, you may feel a little abandoned by me because I am not facing trial, uh, and you are. But I have to confess to the audience here that at first I wanted to act pro bono for one of the defendants until I saw the films, all these uh, tape recordings. I was standing next to him practically all the time. So I couldn't possibly cross-examine the policeman <laughs> because I was there. Now, I, I like to think positively about the future. Nothing is unchangeable. How do you know that our President Xi Jinping would not find it necessary to show the world leaders that he is not to be scared of, that he could be trusted. Now, I'm not saying that he would like to be a nice guy. I'm saying that he might find it unavoidable to at least show the rest of the world that he is not such a terrible guy. And he could just lift a little finger to lift the pressure from Hong Kong and give Benny Thai democracy. You know, it, it is not impossible. I mean, if you, if you ask me, would it happen tomorrow? Of course not. 10 years time, maybe not. But how can you say that it will never happen? That is where I would join issue with you. I would like to think positively. Nothing is impossible under the sun. So let us at least feel positive about it. And uh, I mean, after this lunch, we'll have dinner tonight, and there'll be lunch again tomorrow. <laughs> so life will go on. And I don't want Benny, I don't want you to, to see that this is the end of the world. I mean, you, you may well go to prison. Right? I have seen younger people than you going to prison, and they all survive. They come out, in fact, better guys. So. Benny, I don't think you will ever concede defeat. Yeah, surely you never I'm will. Must be thinner. Then. You will <laughs> never. You will never give up. I yeah. mean, uh, you may say this is the end of the world, but no, no, no. But you'll keep on fighting. So let yeah. us fight together. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I learned that from Martin. I was his past intern, so I all the things I'm doing, a lot of things from Martin. Thank you, Martin. And soon you'll be going to prison, <laughs> for for my sake. <laughs> Okay, next question. Please introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, uh, Ben Black from the Financial Times. Um, a lot of people talk about how rule of law is essential to Hong Kong as a business center, but so far there's been no interest at all from either international companies or Hong Kong businesses or, of course, mainland companies in the sorts of problems that you're talking about. So do you think there's ever a point at which this impacts the business community or given that so many of these investors are happy doing business in mainland China where it's much harder, they simply don't care and they're happy to let academic freedom and freedom of speech go, uh, and they think there'll be enough confidence in the commercial side of rule of law to keep doing business here. Well, uh, that's, therefore, that's the reason why I have used rule, not used rule by law, but mm -hmm. authoritarian rule of law to describe the present situation. Actually, it's very much like the system in Singapore. You have a due system. In the civil or the economic side, you will, have, you will be able to see almost all the elements of the rule of law, of uh, uh, in, uh, practicing independent judiciary, all these things. And so the business sector may not feel a problem. But at the political side, then there's the limitations, the constraints, 
and uh, all the red lines being withdrawn again and again. So to the business sector, if they do not see the importance of the freedoms of the people in the civil society and just cared about all the things with the dollar sign, then there will be no change or no impact. But just that, whether you do business and you just care about business and only business, maybe that's a situation, but whatever, as Martin said, we'll continue to fight. Uh, very briefly, can I, I, think, I think they do care. Um, they do mind. Uh, otherwise, they won't send their kids to the US, the UK, the EU, and different parts of the world, which are mostly democratic countries, to continue their education, even you know, leave Hong Kong or China for good. Um, they do care, but they can't be as outspoken as we are. So the way I look at myself and Benius as well would be, we are the norm entrepreneurs. We are bringing the universal values all the way from different parts of the world and try to get them done as best we, the best we can in Hong Kong. Well, I'm pessimistic, Martin, to very briefly respond to that overall uh, theme here. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we are, we are fearful, okay? I think this is important to overcome fear against the odds. But you know, I can't just lie about being hello. Tomorrow will be fine. You know, tomorrow will be de de democratized. Uh, Hong Kong will be democratized. China will be democratized. Uh, what's important is to overcome the sense of self-fulfilling prophecy that nothing can be done is is the dead end, and therefore we should surrender, succumb to the power that be. I think, uh, given my background, probably you know something. I, I study Poland solidarity movement. But don't trust the power that be. Don't rely on them to democratize China. It's up to the people, civil society. Here we are. This is important. We have to really connect and get the network up and running and keep Hong Kong as international as possible. And therefore, this year, a lot of friends, civil society friends, have, go all the way to, have gone all the way to Geneva uh, to sit in the hearings at the UN's ICCPR and all the other international conventions that are applicable to Hong Kong according to the basic law. We have to stay international. Thank you. Next question, please. Hi, Benny. Uh, we do of Channel News Asia. You made a comment about the case against Edward Leung, uh, that the judge was very pro-order. But hasn't that always been the case in Hong Kong? You're looking at a court system with a conviction rate of over 90%. Uh, do you think, in a way, when people talk about political influence over the course, they're really picking the wrong target? And my second question um, is about the interpretation, because the basic law gave China a unilateral power to interpret the basic law whenever they can find an anchor, they could essentially rewrite Hong Kong's local law. Within the so-called common law tradition, is there any avenue for the local courts to fight back, or that, that battle is completely lost? Well, actually, the two questions are related. Uh, you're right. They're actually, uh, all judges belong to the pro-establishment. I'm not, I'm not saying that the judge uh, is a member of the pro-establishment camp. I mean that the my mentality is pro-establishment. It's part of the establishment. And so it's very natural for judges to uh, consider order as some kind of overriding concerns in some cases. Um, but still, speaking from a legal researcher, uh, that actually there's sufficient room also for a judge to question whether the order itself is just. And also, is there's sufficient room for judges to um, kind of consider the reasons why the person tried to disturb the social order, but just the choice of the judge. And that, so that's, therefore, I'm not saying that the judge was wrong. I'm not saying in that sense. But I'm just saying that that reflect a very, a very pro-order uh, pro uh, kind of mentality. And uh, we can have judges put lesser concern of the order, but more on the th other things I've mentioned about the legitimacy of the order and also the motivation of the offenders. So that's still possible. Uh, that our common law system could allow. Now, uh, going to your second question. Um, yes, again, that is possible for our courts, especially for the highest court, the Court of Final Appeal, to uh, 
deal with the interpretation by the standing committee in uh, smarter ways. Now, the unfortunately, the Court of Final Appeal accept almost unquestionably the interpretation by the standing committee. And that's, all, that's also why I say that I observe that now the standing committee or the CCP is more prepared to normalize the use of this power because our court seems to accept that unquestionably. Um, now, again, based on research on uh, other authoritarian rule of law systems, um, judges, some judges, because of their pro-establishment mindset, they may naturally put forward uh, judgments very much in line with the needs of the authoritarian system. And this is not that they are not independent. They are actually making those decisions independently. But there may be also judges uh, who embrace thicker understanding of the rule of law, but knowing the kind of political constraint. So they will try to avoid the issue, not to put themselves into trouble or put the court in, in, into uh, kind of threats because under authoritarian system, judges, the court, actually have nothing to defend against the authoritarian uh, rulers. But maybe some reformed-minded judges could find some kind of room to provide, not, not directly supporting or going against the authoritarian system, but providing some more room for the activists in the society to continue their fight against the authoritarian system. Now that's why I'm not, I'm a bit unhappy about the decision just because that the judges, or the judge did not provide this room for the activists. Uh, do you want to comment as well? Yeah. Next question. Yeah, we have two. Still have a few minutes. Okay, Edith and then Natasha. Yeah. <coughs> Hi, Edith Terry, uh, former journalist. Um, Professor Tai um, and Professor Chan. Um, but mainly to you, uh, Benny. Um, as one of the architects of Occupy Central and the Umbrella Movement, how do you assess the aftermath, both on the level of civil society and government, including the central government? Well, uh, it's difficult for me to assess the impact on the governments, but I may just refer to a, a recent article I read. Actually, the study was done in 2015 by actually an academic in Hong Kong um, looking at the, the understanding of civil disobedience by Hong Kong people. He compared the, the, uh, uh, the empirical data in September 2013. That's the, we have already started the movement in September 2013. And, um, and a survey done in October 2014, so around a, a year time, that his finding was that the understanding of civil disobedience. That's a very substantial increase of the understanding. Now the assumption is that if you, have, if you can understand the idea more, the chance that you agree with the idea will be more. So that's the basic assumption. And so we can find that the umbrella move, the Occupy Central, and also the, no study after the umbrella movement. So we may have to know what happened after that. But my view is that it's very likely that the idea of civil disobedience or the uh, uh, commitment to strive for democracy is getting stronger after the Umbrella Movement. But just that we are still looking for or searching for another moment in order we can advance. Or as, as I say, at this point, we may be playing the defense position, but at some point we may be able to advance. So. I, w I would say that we still need more study to assess the impact of the umbrella movement. It may be still early to say anything about the impact of the umbrella movement. And I can use my case to talk about <laughs> the impact of the June 4th yes. in 1989. At that time, I was almost like at the age of ever learn. And I can still, I think I'm still influenced by the June 4th. What I'm doing here at this very moment, I'm still under the influence of June 4th, 1989. So we can foresee that the umbrella movement 
will have the similar kind of or degree of impact to the young people of Hong Kong. Maybe 10 years from now, 20 years from now, there may be someone leading another big movement in the society and he or she might be inspired by the umbrella movement. Um, very briefly, uh, although the question was directed at Benny, but uh, I've written an article about civil societies in Hong Kong. Civil society is a very interesting animal. It's a, ver a very interesting animal in Hong Kong. It's very resilient. Uh, you don't see big demonstrations or you know, occupy actions or movements in Hong Kong now. It doesn't mean that they are gone. Uh, because I talk about the ICCPR public hearing in Geneva in March of this year, I, I did study how civil society organizations responded to this round of uh, 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 public hearings. Two grand coalitions uh, involving 99 old civil society groups in Hong Kong participated in this particular round of ICCPR uh, cycle. So they are there, they're active, and they're articulating the core values of Hong Kong people, Hong Kong society at the international level. And they stand united against Article 23 legislation, uh, promoting genuine uh, universal suffrage according to Article 25 of the International Covenant of Political and Civil Rights. So we are, we are alive and we are kicking, and we are not gone. Thank you. Thank you. Quickly, one last question. From Great, Natasha. thanks. Um, my name is Natasha Khan. I'm from the Wall Street Journal. Um, I'm wondering, uh, some of the examples you talked about in terms of academic freedom have to do with the political movement, and, um, but I'm wondering if you have any examples of uh, censorship or chilling effect on other areas of study, for example, for Tiananmen or Tibet, Tibetan studies in Hong Kong at the tertiary level. Um, Cambridge University Press, remember that story? Yes. Clearly, it's blatant, blatant, blatant attack on academic freedom. From where? Beijing. And C CUP kowtowed. This is astonishing. But at the same time, we fought back, right? We, we joined petitions, global petition, against the decision of self-censorship or imposed censorship from Beijing. And we won that battle. But that's only one of those uh, examples to show exactly the kind of life we live in. And we are not, if we are not vigilant, and we are not aware of the situation, things are slowly, just like salami tactics, piece by piece, slide by slice, we'll be gone. So I think we have to stay vigilant. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry to announce that uh, time is uh, up. Uh, enormous thanks to our two uh, brilliant uh, speakers, uh, Professor Benitain and Professor uh, Kenneth Chan. I'd like to keep uh, the sentences of Martin Lee that nothing is uh, unchangeable. And uh, I'll have a small token of uh, appreciation to you and to show you that we are not, we're trying not to be biased. Uh, we have one yellow and one blue umbrella. You can pick the one. They are the official colors of the club, so uh, nothing, nothing political.